Good afternoon, everyone. So it's great to be here. And my name is Ipek Shinar. I work as an associate research scientist at Texas A&M Transportation Institute in Austin, Texas. <clears throat> I will be moderating this session on micromobility safety, and I'm really looking forward to listening to our panelists and, and diving into our discussion. Um, I would like to just start um, by thanking to all of you for joining our session. <clears throat> These are certainly challenging times. I hope you are all doing well uh, during these uh, times. Unfortunately, we could not meet in person, but I really appreciate the opportunity of being together virtually, uh, being part of this discussion and listening uh, to the great minds. And before we move into our panel, um, I also would like to acknowledge the hard work of Shared Use Mobility Center in getting this virtual summit together. Uh, they have done an amazing job in a very short time frame. Um, and for this session in particular, I would like to acknowledge uh, Albert and Benedict and Rudy <coughs> Faust. Uh, we have been working with them uh, regularly, so special thanks and go to them. And one final business item is uh, SIMC's Mobility On Demand Learning Center. Uh, so we would like to attract your attention to this learning center, uh, which is a community resource tool for uh, sharing knowledge about shared mobility. So in the context of our panel, the learning center includes uh, quite a bit of information on micromobility that you might find useful. For instance, a case study on Seattle bike share, uh, scooter share, parking policies, accessibility program information. So you can find the, um, the link to the website on the slide and the, uh, the, the session is being recorded and <clears throat> all the information will be provided to you. So please uh, feel free to check the learning center. So let's get back to our panel um, topic. Today we are going to have three excellent presentations. And before we move into that, I would like to mention a few things uh, to just set the stage. So over the past decade, our transportation system has been shifting from being vehicle-centric to more user-centric. Uh, we have all experienced new mobility options and incorporated, try to incorporate them into our travel habits, uh, thanks to advances in technology and data analytics. However, because of this ongoing change in transportation and mobility options, as well as the technology, uh, terminology is still evolving for any mode of, or any new mode of transportation and has yet to be standardized, including micromobility options. And the discrepancies in definitions eventually lead to confusion uh, in our communication between uh, policymakers, practitioners, service providers, researchers, and the public. Therefore, I thought it would be important that we first define what we are really talking about here, even if, it's, if it seems clear to many of us. So I'm going to adopt a definition provided in a recent report that I have just actually seen, uh, published very recently last, last month or so by the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, which uh, defines micromobility as the range of small, lightweight devices operating at speeds typically below 15 miles per hour and is ideal for short trips or shorter trips up to five to six miles or 10 kilometer. So this then leads us to a definition of shared micromobility, which can be referred as shared use fleets of these small lightweight vehicles devices. Uh, among others, um, bike sharing, whether it's a station base or dockless, and scooter sharing are the most common forms. And the last two years have been uh, really revolutionary for these two modes. We have seen uh, almost an explosion, particularly in the usage of e-scooters. So according to NACTO, um, we, uh, we had more than 80 million trips of shared micromobility services in 2018. And as of July 2019, according to data from BTS, um, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, uh, e-scooter systems have grown within the last two years from zero to more than 140 systems across our nation. And this, <clears throat> uh, as you might expect, has changed and continues to change the nature of our mobility ecosystem and in a quite disruptive way. So with this popularity, with its popularity, while providing a great alternative to motorized vehicles, 
Several questions have been raised around micromobility safety, particularly for their users and pedestrians, but also for any roadway users, uh, especially vulnerable roadway users like individuals with disabilities uh, who have been influenced greatly by this emerging mode in one way or the other. So when we are talking about micromobility safety, um, it's very important that we are inclusive and invite everyone, invite all to the table. And when we are working towards a safe operation of this growing mode, it's really important that we keep in mind the need to maintain uh, an accessible, uh, feasible, and equitable mobility option for everyone. So although we are focusing on safety, I wanted to come up with a, an acronym for safe, uh, safe, accessible, feasible, and equitable, um, feasible including, for instance, the affordability um, part as well. So this is what really motivated us um, to develop this session and bring together three distinct but complementary perspectives. A service providing perspective, a community perspective with a focus on disability, and a policy making perspective. So we are going to start with Ron Burke from Lyft and then continue with uh, Anna Zuwartz from Rooted in Rights and conclude our presentations with Joel Miller from Seattle Department of Transportation. Everyone will do some kind of self-introduction. And um, I would like to note that we will start with our, with our presentations and then open up the stage for a QA session. Um, but please feel free to send any questions that you might have during presentations. I will keep an eye on them, perhaps organize them a bit and start directing your questions uh, to our panelists during our QA session at the end. And without further ado, I would like to leave the stage uh, to Ron. If you, Ron, are you ready to share? Maybe I can stop sharing my screen. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. We'll see if we can get this to work. Huh? All right. Okay. Loading, loading, here it comes. Oh, I'm on the wrong slide, that's for sure. Let's see if we can get up to the... Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> here we go. Well, hi, I am Ron Burke. Uh, with the Lyft Transit Bikes and Scooter Policy Team. I'm based in Chicago and work in the central US and also Denver to advance policies and partnerships that support micromobility. Uh, I wanna thank the Shared Use Mobility Center for inviting us to, to be on this panel today. So this is a, a, an overview of my presentation and really uh, my goal today is just to describe the comprehensive approach that Lyft Micromobility takes to promoting uh, micromobility safety uh, in, in the markets where we operate. Um, we recognize that while the conversation um, typically zeroes in on how to design products, um, how to regulate customer behavior, uh, you know, to prevent sidewalk riding and, and inappropriate sidewalk park parking, while that's often the conversation and it's a very important piece of the overall strategy for improving uh, micromobility safety. There's more to it than that, right? Um, we really need a comprehensive approach. Um, improving transportation safety for people walking, biking, and scootering is a lot about policy and infrastructure in addition to product design and, and customer education. Um, you know, when people ride scooters or bikes on the sidewalks, it's often because the alternative, riding next to moving cars, is scary. Um, lack okay. of oh, Rod? Sorry? Oh, Ron, I'm uh, jump in. I'm sorry to interrupt. The uh, we're stuck on the one slide again. Uh, Seriously? Yeah. It's not. Uh, you're not on slide two. No, we're on slide twenty-four. Oh my gosh, that's weird. Huh. That's not what I'm showing. <laughs> All right. So should we start over? With yeah. This? Let's, yeah. Let's try it again. Let's see if this works. Is, what are you seeing now? Go. Now we see the overview, uh, comprehensive approach. That's where I wanted to be. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that, folks. Thanks, Ron. Um, thanks for flagging that. So I won't repeat what I just said, but basically um, we're, we're using a comprehensive approach to advance micromobility safety. We know that, um, you know, when scooters are inappropriately parked, one of the reasons that happens is lack of commute and scooter parking. When people are injured while biking, scootering, and walking, there's often a car involved. So 
it's it, you know it's important that regulating micromobility devices and customers not be the sole focus of how we advance micromobility safety. We also have to look at systemic policy and street design changes as well. So let me know if, if you're not seeing the next slide. I just switched. Are we good? All right. Um, so our vision really at Lyft is uh, for car ownership to be optional and for cities to really be designed around people instead of cars. Um, we know transportation is a critical source of economic and social mobility, but car ownership is expensive. Um, it's expensive to the car owner, it's expensive to taxpayers who subsidize roads and parking uh, to accommodate you know, personal automobiles that are that typically sit idle about 95% of the time. Uh, as this slide shows, there are many ways to get around without owning or parking a car. And so um, I just want to give you a little glimpse into what who Lyft is, what Lyft is. I think, I think you all probably know who we are, but just wanted to share a few slides before I dive deeper into the safety uh, work that we're doing just about Lyft as a whole. So, you know, our goal really is to help people live, again, without owning a car or with owning fewer cars and connecting them to a variety of options through the Lyft app, connecting them to transit and, and to Lyft rides. We uh, operate many of the largest bike share systems in the nation and we're expanding these systems with e-bikes. Um, currently, for example, in Chicago and Minneapolis, where I work, we're expanding bike share to include the entire cities. Chicago, for example, already has the largest bike share service area in the country. Uh, and in partnership with the city, we will more than double the service area by 2022 to cover the entire city, which is more than 200 square miles. At Lyft, we, we're really focusing on micromobility, uh, operating micromobility in large cities, cities where we have long-term agreements uh, or the potential for long-term agreements, um, and where we see supportive policy environments. I'll touch on that a little bit more later. Uh, we have seen scooter operations in some markets recently um, related to COVID and, and ridership drops and, and also to policy environments that just aren't especially supportive. But we continue to operate scooters and, and we're excited about that as well. So these are the four pillars for uh, our transit bikes and scooter work. Um, I'm going to focus today on, on safe streets, but transit integration, environmental sustainability, and transportation equity are equally important um, to our approach to advancing micromobility. So again, I want to not focus solely on product design and how we how we educate and regulate customer behavior. I also want to talk about what we're doing to advance policy and infrastructure change. Um, and so I'm going to get into that right now, real quickly. So at the federal level, um, as many folks who are listening probably know, um, the federal government has provided relatively little funding for to support bike share and scooter share directly, and in some cases have adopted programs that are really counter, um, that are, that are uh, obstacles like eliminating the bike commuter benefit. So we're working on reinst uh, reinstating that, <clears throat> uh, reducing obstacles to federal funding for bike share, reauthorizing the Federal Transportation Act, um, and, and, and so doing increasing funding for micromobility infrastructure like, like protected bike lanes, for example. Federal government has a big role to play. Um, all of these improvements help advance micromobility safety. At the state level, um, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if, if states didn't uh, were blocking micromobility or didn't properly enable it. Um, and there has been a lot of activity at the state level in recent years, most, most of it good, um, but we have also had to fend off some bad bills as well that would have uh, essentially made micromobility um, next to impossible to operate. So um, we're seeing some progress there. And as you probably know, um, when it comes to local policy, the rubber really hits the road at the local level. Um, you know, an important strategy for Lyft is partnering with local advocates who are working day in and day out to make streets safer in their communities. For example, we support Our Streets Minneapolis's campaign to advocate for Vision Zero funding for high crash streets uh, in Minneapolis. In Denver, we support the Denver Streets Partnerships campaign to reduce um, speed limits and their pop-up bike lane projects to build support for permanent bike lanes. We do also directly engage with local decision makers as well to build support for safe street strategies like protected bike lanes and on-street bike and scooter share parking. Um, again, if we're gonna really make micromobility safer and, and increase ridership, we know that um, 
we need to create a new transportation ecosystem with streets that are safe for everyone, um, including those walking and using micromobility. And uh, micromobility needs to be equitable, accessible, and supported across diverse communities. We're just not going to get the type of systemic policy and street design changes to unlock the full potential of micromobility or to see the ridership growth that really, ridership growth that can really provide safety in numbers if we don't um, have broad community support and a diverse ridership. So, so to that end, Lyft supports numerous uh, community organizations to help educate and engage diverse communities with micromobility. So for example, in Chicago, where, where I live, we partner with Blackstone Bicycle Works, Westtown Bikes, and the Safer Foundation on a bike mechanic boot camp program that helps underserved youth um, develop useful technical, uh, managerial, and finance skills in addition to um, repairing bikes, of course. Um, we are also working with uh, Scraper Bikes in Oakland to establish the community-run bike lending library at the Shed. Uh, which is a thriving community center in East Oakland. We're partnering with Think Outside, we have partnered with Think Outside the Block in Chicago to hold our largest community Divi bike ride last year with over 500 participants. And in New York City, we, uh, Urban Upbound is a key partner in promoting the financial benefits of reduced fare bike share. And again, the reason I'm mentioning this is, you know, strength in numbers, community support, um, a diversity of communities engaging and using um, micromobility, all of this is necessary if we're truly going to tap the full potential of micromobility and make it safe uh, everywhere, not just in a few neighborhoods. Speaking of which, so I talked about our reduced fare uh, programming. We offer these um, uh, discount programs in all of our markets. Um, and uh, our reduced fare participants average about 100, over 100 trips per year, which is pretty cool. We have over 28,000 people enrolled in these discount programs and they took over 1.8 million rides in 2019. We're also supporting uh, kind of bikes and scooters to attract new riders, more riders, safety in numbers, building community support for policy and infrastructure change through a variety of kind of community engagement activities and, and using media and social media to get the word out. The, you can see here on the left, um, we've talked about, uh, we've featured Ginger who's 63 and has taken 10,000 bike share trips, awesome. You know, people need to know that lots of different types of people, people from all walks of life um, enjoy micromobility. So now I'll get into real quickly uh, product design and education, which I, again, is, is what these conversations typically focus on, but I, it's something that we're, it's really important to us, obviously, at Lyft. Um, um, you know, a big part of our strategy is in sh having bi uh, bikes that lock and dock. Um, to you know, help prevent obstruction of sidewalks, crosswalks, or disabled parking zones. So again, our bikes can be docked at a classic docking station, um, and our and then our new e-bikes can be docked at a classic station or locked at a at a bike rack, uh, like you see here. Um, when it comes to scooter share, we have a variety of strategies that we deploy to encourage um, a proper uh, riding and parking. Uh, you can see some of those here. Um, in terms of identifying uh, geofence slow zones. Uh, this is in-app uh, communication with our riders, uh, restricted parking zones. We create incentive zones to um, persuade, encourage people to park in the right place and not just leave the scooter anywhere. We also do um, uh, photo verification of properly parked scooters. Um, so like when you, when, you, when you first get on one of our scooters, this is an example of the onboarding that you see to educate someone, uh, a new rider, about how to, to ride and park safely um, in, the, in their community. We also use a variety of kind of community engagement events to, we call them scooticket events or scooticket education, to get the word out um, at events. Uh, we'll often we'll hand out free helmets as well to encourage helmet riding with, with scooters as well as bikes. And these are just some images of um, some of those events we've done in the past. We're also, one of our goals is to be 100% compliant with local rules. That's really important for Lyft bikes and scooters. And we have this proprietary fleet tracking technology that helps us keep tabs on our bikes and scooters, or at least our e-bikes and e-scooters. And we have a different approach for our pedal bikes. But what you can see here is a really sophisticated approach to making sure that we know where our bikes are, and we're identifying issues and we're responding quickly to any problems that, were, that are being reported. 
Um, also on our app and our partner apps, um, we're identifying bike lanes, help people, again, be safer. Uh, people feel safer and actually are safer when they bike and ride scooters in bike lanes. Um, we also do work with our rideshare side of the business to encourage, um, to, to limit conflicts with, uh, between cars, bikes, and scooters. This is an example of a kind of a look for bikes and scooters sticker that uh, you'll see in, on lift cars. Um, curb management, of course, is increasingly a big deal, especially with micromobility and, and rideshare and so forth. You know, we um, recognize this is important. And so we have developed um, some strategies to kind of help uh, make things better in that, on that, in that respect. Um, for example, the Lyft app um, helps create smoother rides, uh, pickups and drop-offs uh, as we direct our drivers to avoid bike lanes. Uh, this is an example where um, um, uh, we're, we're sending out a warning about Market Street being car-free and like that's not a good place to go. Um, we're also working closely with um, the nonprofit Share Streets to provide cities with data to help design ride share and delivery, pick up drop off and loading zones to limit conflicts. This is really useful data to help um, cities make good decisions and we do that in partnership with them. Just a real quick sidebar and I'm almost done here. Um, one thing we like about Share Streets in particular is that they provide, Share Streets, Share Streets the nonprofit, um, is that they provide cities analysis tools with aggregated data that protects individuals' privacy. Uh, you may have seen that the ACLU came out today with a report that flags several uh, privacy-related issues with data sharing standards like MDS, which collect enough granular information to re-identify people. Uh, I think it's relevant to flag here since there are many definitions of safety in the context of micromobility and privacy is definitely one of them. Again, back to kind of what we're doing to, uh, on the rideshare side, we, we've done a lot of education around to, to kind of prevent doorings and including um, uh, uh, communicating with our customers in the moment to check for cyclists before opening the door. And we did an education campaign in the past as well um, with some messaging around um, dooring prevention. So that's just a, a snippet of really what we're doing at Lyft to um, advance a, a comprehensive approach to micromobility safety. And I look forward to taking your questions later. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Ron. Um, I think this was really informative and with strong emphasis in that we need accessible and equitable system supporting diverse communities. Uh, it's a nice segue to our next panelist who will bring the community voice into picture. Um, Anna, are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Right, Getting my screen share ready. All right. I believe that's working. You can see my screen? Yes, we do. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna Zivarts. I am the program director of Rooted and Rights. And we are a video advocacy team that's based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we are part of uh, Disability Rights Washington, uh, Disability Rights Washington, and we're a team of disabled filmmakers and activists. And for the last year and a half or so, have been focused a lot on transportation accessibility. This is a photo of our team, um, and there's also a photo of me. Uh, I am a low vision uh, mom. I'm a bike rider a transit user. I've never been able to drive. I uh, grew up in Washington State. I lived in New York City for uh, close to 15 years and recently moved back to Washington State to try to transform our, our transportation system here to make it accessible for more accessible for people like me who don't have access to cars. Uh, and I'm going to just make sure that I'm uh, describing the content on my slides for folks who are low vision or blind in the audience. Um, I will also share some links to the videos I'm going to show uh, in case they're not playing on your computers as smoothly as they, they might. Uh, so my Twitter handle is Anna Zivarts, A-N-N-A-Z-I-V-A-R-T-S, and Rooted in Rights, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Rooted in Rights. All right. I'm gonna read a quote from Ben Green from Smart Enough Cities. Efficiency is a normative goal. It favors particular principles and outcomes at the expense of others, typically altering how status and resources are distributed across society. And I think this is particularly relevant when we talk about micromobility and when we talk about transportation. The disability community in particular uh, experienced some impacts, very negative impacts, um, from the rollout of bike share 
in Seattle. And uh, I speak to this from the Seattle perspective, but I know this is an issue in many other cities as well, uh, both um, primarily with, with the parking of bike share bikes um, throughout the city, blocking access on sidewalks, um, but also you know, issues around riding on sidewalks and not yielding to disabled pedestrians. So uh, to help um, address this issue, we partnered with the City of Seattle, and Joel will talk about this perhaps a little later, uh, to create an educational video to educate uh, bike share users about the impacts of, of what happens um, when they park their, their bikes incorrectly. And I think, you know, I mean, everyone's like, oh, bike share is great. You know, you can get where you're going more quickly. You don't have to walk. You don't have to get in a car. Um, and those things are all true, uh, but it can completely block access for the disabled community who rely on sidewalks, many of us, to get around, um, especially if you're a wheelchair user or you're or blind. So I'm going to just play this video um, that I think really helps illustrate um, for people who aren't aware of what our experience is like of the city. Hi, I'm Dorian. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm blind. I'm a wheelchair user and I'm here to talk about the dreaded bike blockers. A bike share blocks Dorian's way. It falls over as he squeezes past. Next, another bike blocking the sidewalk entangles Jacob's white cane. Bike share might be good for some people, but it's not good for me because I use a white cane. I get frustrated because my cane gets caught in the spoke. A bike in front of the curb ramp blocks Dorian's way as he rolls through a crosswalk. Next, a bike partially blocking the sidewalk is still in Jacob's way. Bike blocking is good for no one. Don't dump your bikes against the wall of a building because my arms get caught in the handlebars and it makes it difficult for blind and low vision people to find the entrance to the building. You can park your bike at a bike rack or in the space between the sidewalk and the street. Bad parking. Good parking. And use common sense. Don't block access to transit stops, curb ramps, benches, driveways, or doors. There should be at least six feet of clear space for pedestrian access. If you see a bike parked wrong, please move it to the correct safe place. Bike blocking is not cool. It's rude. It's dangerous. Let's make bike share work for everyone. Park correctly. Produced by Rooted in Lights and Seattle Department of Transportation. For more on bike share, go to seattle.gov slash transportation slash bike dash share. All right, so that's the end of that video. I posted the links to all three videos I'm going to show um, in the, the chat function. So if you weren't able to view it smoothly, feel free to watch it on your own time. As you can see from this video, access uh, bike share and other micro mobility can create real access challenges for the disability community. And so often what you'll find is disabled activists come out hard against uh, rolling out bike share and scooter share in cities because we've seen um, what it can do to the, the critical ways that we um, need to access our cities. At the same time, uh, it is possible to partner with the disability community. And I think this is what we're starting to see here in Seattle, that if, um, if relationships are made, if disabled folks are brought into the process and consulted about how to roll out these systems, and if we create the infrastructure so that we're not competing, so that bike share isn't coming at the cost of pedestrians, that perhaps instead it's coming at the cost of uh, non-disabled parking spots or travel lanes of car traffic, then, uh, then we won't be pitting the disability community against, um, against uh, micromobility and, and uh, bikes and scooters. Um, I think we you know, have to think about this as well as we think about um, autonomous vehicles and delivery robots. You can see here, this is a, a slide um, that shows a tweet uh, from a wheelchair user who found her way blocked coming off of a crosswalk because there was an autonomous vehicle uh, delivery robot um, blocking that crosswalk. And so uh, you know, we need to think about access in our uh, in our sidewalks and in our street spaces. Another key part of this is our access during the winter. I think for many scooter companies, just you know, pull, pull up their scooters and go when it gets snowy. Um, for disabled folks who need the sidewalks to get around, we need that access. And so our advocacy for snow clearing on sidewalks um, can be really critical to, to help make our cities uh, possible for micromobility year round. I'm going to play just the beginning of this video, which is um, 
featuring an activist here in Seattle talking about his experience when we had some epic snowstorms uh, last year. A man in a power chair drives down a sidewalk. People often ask me, uh, how did I manage to get around in the weather lately with the snow? And I tell them, I didn't. I didn't leave my house for eight days at one point. For many people, it means they can't access basic services that they need. I've talked to other people with disabilities, and some, for example, have dialysis treatments. Others have other medical appointments that they need to get to, or even just getting out and getting food. I believe that the city can do a number of things to make things better next time. They should prioritize key areas, including mass transit, for example, and making sure those are accessible usable to people with disabilities. I think that they need to have plans for helping people with disabilities, for example, who can't clear their sidewalks so they can actually get down the street. And um, I think they should just have a clear plan that they communicate to everyone. Well, the disability community wants to see that they are willing to make this a priority going forward and that they will take proactive steps to make sure people with disabilities don't face these same issues the next time. All right, so um, this uh, video actually got retweeted by AOC, which we were pretty excited about. And we were able to convince the Seattle Department of Transportation to um, change the way they communicated the need for people to clear their own sidewalks um, this winter. And we saw um, a lot more uh, outreach and enforcement going into uh, the snow that we had this winter, which wasn't as epic as the year before. Um, but it really, I think it did make a difference and signal uh, to the disability community that, that uh, we mattered and that we were included and also um, that sidewalks are a critical part of our transportation network, just like roads. Um, this is another piece of advocacy work we did uh, in partnership with the city of Seattle and other advocacy organizations around automated traffic uh, enforcement cameras um, to keep cars out of bike, uh, bus lanes and to keep cars from blocking intersections. Play a quick clip of this. Hi, I'm Vanessa. I'm Clark. We both live in Seattle. We both use wheelchairs. And we're both tired of these cars blocking the intersection. <laughs> Clark and Vanessa attempt to cross the street, but a van blocks the crosswalk. Then they navigate around a huge charter bus blocking the crosswalk. Next, they attempt to weave through several cars blocking an intersection. Seriously? I, I don't know. Try not to die, please. For pedestrians who can't step up onto the sidewalk, blocking a curb ramp means we have to ride in the street through traffic just to get out of the intersection. The reality is when you block the box, you block us out. It's our access and it's our safety. Better enforcement at intersections will make our streets safer for everyone. A message from Rooted in Rights and Transportation Choices Coalition, Transit for All. Great. So uh, after a couple of years of having this piece of legislation stall in our state legislature to allow the city of Seattle to install these automated traffic enforcement cameras, um, we actually got it passed this year. And so we're looking forward to seeing um, bus lanes that are kept clear from cars and intersections that are kept clear so uh, those of us who are pedestrians can cross safely. So I think you know there are really uh, wonderful examples of what uh, we can achieve if we are working together rather than being pitted against each other. But we do need to be at the table. And, and this is particularly concerning as we start to have these conversations around autonomous uh, cars, autonomous delivery. If you Google uh, or you look up uh, autonomous vehicles on Shutterstock, this is one of the first images that pops up, um, this beautiful world that has zero pedestrians. Um, and you know, just like pedestrians are left out of this picture, I think the disability community is very often left out of transportation planning conversations. Um, and we need to change that. Um, this is a, a, a project that I just wanna highlight to end um, that we are working on in partnership with the Seattle Department of Transportation, with the Washington State uh, Department of Transportation, with Sound Transit and with King County Metro. Um, there is a large cloverleaf intersection uh, in uh, cl very close to downtown Seattle that crosses one of the main arterials, the north-south arterials. Uh, and so as a pedestrian or a cyclist um, going north-south on this arterial, you have to cross these on-ramps and off-ramps. And this is a photo of um, a group of us that were touring this situation um, with some WashDOT and SDOT and Sound Transit and King County Metro folks. Um, and you can see there's a car here uh, speeding off an on-ramp and there's unmarked crosswalk that you have to cross here to get across and go north and south on this arterial. 
Um, here's a very short video of, of one of these. Um, this is the on-ramp situation. And there's a group of pedestrians standing here in the rain and while cars are accelerating on this curved on-ramp, um, trying to enter the intersection. Um, so we are working with SDOT and WASHOT for some short-term improvements to actually have some painted uh, crosswalks here. Um, and then uh, eventually, so to narrow some of these on-ramp situations and um, install some street furniture uh, to install uh, additional signals for cars to slow down and eventually to close one of the on-ramps and install a, um, or place it with a, with a T intersection with a light so that um, we don't have these sort of freeway uh, or suburban designed, um, not pedestrian friendly uh, pieces of infrastructure in the middle of our, our downtown and our city. Um, so yeah, that's it. I, I just wanna emphasize that I, I encourage every transportation agency and all the ride hailing and uh, micromobility companies to not only consult with uh, people with disabilities and other marginalized communities, hire and uh, pay for the expertise, because I think for a lot of us, transportation is a major barrier, has been, will continue to be. It's something we think about a lot. And uh, by including us from the beginning in your processes uh, and valuing our opinions, uh, we'll come up with solutions that work better for all of us. Thanks. Anna, thank you very much. This was wonderful. I can't agree more on the need to have everyone on the table and work together from the very beginning. I think we have a lot to learn from you and you provided many food for thought. Um, now it's time to hear from our last panelist for the city perspective. Joel, are you ready to share? Yes, I am ready. Um, let's see. Make sure this works. Okay, do you guys see the screen? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, thank you everyone and thank you for the uh, Shared Use Mobility Center for um, hosting this. Um, so I'm Joel Miller. I am the Bike Share Program Manager for the City of Seattle. And I wanna talk a little bit about um, our perspective and what we've done here in Seattle uh, for our Bike Share Program. I came on board to the city um, in 2017 in this role. And that was shortly after we launched our first bike share, free floating bike share pilot. And um, was there for kind of the transition from that, the evaluation of that program into a uh, full-time permanent program passed legislation. Um, we ran that for a year, evaluated again, and now we're doing our third iteration of this. So um, bring a lot of kind of the experience of seeing how this can change, how it can shift, and how cities need to change and shift with it um, to make sure that micromobility micro is a safe and accessible mode of transportation. Um, I am going to give you a little bit of a brief history of Seattle, what we've done here um, with Bike Share talk a bit about our evaluation that we just published, a bit of a plug for that, um, but give some context. Um, what kind of ridership did we see? What kind of struggles do we see before we move into a little bit of the wonky section of my presentation, talking about parking and maintenance audits. I'm gonna go into a little more detail than I ever have before, but I think um, we're ready and I think cities are getting ready to talk about this. And in this virtual summit, I can't see everybody yawn when I go into it, so I'm gonna take advantage of that. Um, I want to talk a lot about education, a lot about enforcement, how that's changed over the years, and then um, acknowledge COVID and, and briefly finish up with, with what we've done for, for that. Um, okay, so a brief history of bike share in Seattle. Seattle actually had a traditional dock-based bike share system. It ran for about three years. From 2014 to 2017, it was called Pronto. It had about 50 stations spread across a couple sections of the city and about 500 bikes. Um, Pronto required some city funding, some city resources, and it really never took off in terms of ridership. It never kind of crossed that barrier where people, a lot of people were depending on it to get around. Um, it ran into some political issues, um, had some unfavorable stories in the Seattle Times here. And in spring of 2017, the mayor and city council said, shut it down and, and um, Pronto went away. 
Um, and that left Seattle as one of the only major cities without any sort of bike share system. While well, at the same time, this new idea was coming over from Asia uh, for free floating or dockless bike share. Um, my colleagues that were there before me, um, including Andrew's on this call, shout out to Andrew, um, quickly pivoted and in a matter of just a few months went from a concept to an actual permit in place for a free floating bike share pilot program. That program um, kind of revolved around some key points. One was that the city was gonna be out of the operations business. We were gonna permit private uh, vendors. Um, we were gonna regulate those operations though. We were gonna regulate how many vendors, how many bikes, and how the whole thing worked. And to do that, we were gonna collect fees and we were gonna collect data so we could have a, a, a tight um, look at what was happening out there. We ran that pilot uh, through a year. We did an evaluation. We passed some legislation and um, instituted a full-time permit program that we called Permit 2.0. Um, we launched out with two vendors, Jump and Lime. There was a third permanent vendor, our friends over at Lyft, but they were never able actually to launch here. Um, we ran that for about a year. We evaluated that and we shifted and we changed the permit structure a bit again. Some of the rules um, we'll go over those changes and we are now in what we call permit 3.0. Um, and so now a little of the top end, the very, very top end, our evaluation report. Um, we saw about 2.2 million rides last year. Um, that's very similar to what we saw the year before. That's 10 times the number we saw with Pronto and our dock-based system. Um, an important shift was last year, we had about 3,000 to 7,000 bikes. That's a lot of bikes. Um, the year before though, we had about six to 9,000 bikes. Um, so we saw similar ridership the year before, we also had about 2.2 million rides, um, actually a little more uh, this year than the year before um, on a smaller fleet. And that was going from the shift of a mix of e-bikes and regular bikes to all e-bikes. Um, we did some surveying work and we found that about 33% of those trips we estimate replaced a car trip. That's really important to us, that includes um, private automobile use, TNC use, um, car share use, um, all of those modes, but we think at least 33%, it might be more of those 2.2 million trips replaced a car trip. And um, those surveys also showed us that almost a quarter, actually about a quarter of Seattle residents used bike share in 2019. And that number matches um, what our previous year's um, survey showed as well using a very different methodology. So, um, looking at those two numbers, we're pretty confident. I was been surprised both times, but happy that it shows that bike share is reaching such a large group of people. I wanna talk a little bit about this graphic on the right. Um, these are four heat maps from Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4, um, showing bike availability. The key variable between these is um, the fleet size. That fleet size was small in Q1, grew in Q2, grew again even more in Q3, and then Q4 we shrunk. Lime um, started pulling out, getting ready to leave the market, and uh, then also just natural winter variants as, as the weather in Seattle can turn a little nasty. Um, bike share use goes down and the companies respond with, with shrinking the fleet. The reason I call out this graphic and why I think it's important is that it shows that as the fleets grow, um, not only does the, the kind of more bikes, not only do more bikes concentrate in the high use areas, they also spread around the city. And um, you get to the point where it's in some of these corners of the city, um, now you're starting to see enough bikes that people can depend on it. They can walk out of their door and say, there's probably gonna be a bike within a few blocks of my house. Um, they can get off the bus at the end of their work day and say, there's probably a bike near the bus stop that I can take to my last mile home or to go meet friends or something like that. Uh, really important. You see that shift when there's fewer bikes, all of a sudden folks that live in these sections of the city can't depend on that. Um, and the, the one of the takeaways from that is really from the city's perspective, from mobility's perspective, maybe not profitability, but mobility, more bikes are better, but a big, big key to that is something we'll get into is that those bikes need to be parked correctly. Um, we also looked at how people were parking bikes and, and did some things that we're really proud of. Um, we built over 1,500 new bike parking spaces last year. 
about 80% of those were in street corrals located right next to an intersection. So this graphic here shows an in street corral right at a stop sign um, that not only it provides bike share places to park, it provides private bikes places to park, and it also provides protection for pedestrians crossing that street. It opens up visibility. Um, it provides uh, more protected space so a car cutting that corner can't cut it quite so tight. Um, so we really see this increased bike parking as a, a triple win for the city. Um, we audited how people were parking and we saw that parking did improve through the year. I'll go through that a little later when I talk about the audits, but that it still needs a lot of work. Um, and that's a, something that I can't really emphasize enough. Um, we need to get better at this. Um, we also collected safety data. We saw seven reported injuries, one serious injury, zero deaths. I think it's really important for cities to talk about this when we're talking about safety. Um, this is data that came from Seattle Police Department crash reports. Uh, that's the best source of data that the city has for our Vision Zero work for kind of all of our, our major safety work. Um, but what we had to do is read all the bike reports and say, hey, which ones did an officer write down bike share or lime or jump or something like that in the report. So are we capturing all the inju injuries? Absolutely not. Um, we think we have a good idea of the serious injuries of the deaths for sure, um, but we're not capturing all the injuries. And as cities start to talk to one another as we're presenting at these conferences, um, that data source can wild, vary so wildly. And um, it's important that, that um, we recognize that and, and a lot of the scooter safety studies that are really, really important are reading emergency department records. Um, and to compare kind of that data to this data is, is, is just not fair. And it's not really looking at scooters and bikes in the same way. And so we need to be careful that those data sources are consistent. And then um, just kind of a third wild card in that whole conversation, we actually started out requiring that vendors tell us every time they heard of an injury. Um, but we didn't really define that. There's not really a good way that we found to define it. Um, the data collection for that end is often a call center somewhere. And we saw that we think we were capturing a lot of, um, frankly, bruised egos. Um, if not a bruised ego, maybe it was a, a slight scrape or something like that. And so that data wasn't helping us and we decided to stop collecting it and uh, just focus on what we knew and, and some level of consistency within the city. I think um, really important as micro mobility expands to have that same level of consistency across cities. Um, and we audited. Uh, this is where I'm going to get a little wonky, um, but I, I think it's important that cities start to talk about this, start to see um, how we're collecting this data so we can compare it to what other cities are doing. Um, we started by breaking down the entire city into little chunks that we thought could be walked or biked in three to five hours. Um, basically census block groups that we edited a few of them. Um, and then we took those audit areas and we tiered them out into four different tiers. Um, the top tier had the most trip ends, the bottom tier had the least trip ends. And then we assigned each one a number within its tier and did a stratified random sample process to choose which areas we were going to audit each quarter. Um, we audited the tier one areas the most, the tier four areas the least. Um, we wanted that to be somewhat representative of the city without leaving out um, the parts of the city that don't see much bike share use at all, but we still wanted to say, hey, we're looking and we're seeing how bikes are parked in your part of town. Um, that gave us um, 13 areas per quarter that we were auditing, usually going out um, once to twice per week with some, with some um, buffer in there. When we would do an audit and we would do it, we also had a third party help us. Um, we would literally walk or bike um, to visually inspect every block in the group. So if there's a short block and you can see down it and you can see there's no bikes, that was fine. You didn't have to walk down that individual block, but you're kind of walking a grid around this entire audit area. You're visually inspecting every bike that you can find. Um, in those inspections, you're recording the time, date, location, the vendor, the bike identification number. Um, you're recording how that bike is parked. This graphic on the right um, shows how last year we were categorizing parking as either correctly parked, not represented on this. It was parked incorrectly, that's the largest blue circle. Um, that's anything that's not perfectly parked according to the, the terms of the permit. 
um, including bikes left on unpaved services, some tipped over, maybe not a hazard for anybody, but not correctly parked. The uh, medium box um, is obstruction hazards. That's bikes that we thought were blocking access somehow, whether that's blocking a sidewalk, a curb ramp, building access, bus stops, the frontage zone uh, that you saw highlighted in, in the video we worked on. Um, those were all called obstruction hazards. And then the top area, the, what we were most concerned about is ADA prohibited obstruction hazards. That follows ADA guidelines um, and really looked at that four foot clearance to, to this bike block that level of clearance. Um, so we judged the bikes like that. Now this year we're going to simplify that and just look at obstruction hazards, um, really trying to look at what the problem is and um, not singling out the ADA prohibited obstruction hazards because of some new methods we're doing on enforcement that I'll get into. Uh, we don't think that is necessary anymore. Um, in those audits, we're also trying to rent about every other bike um, just to see A, if it's rentable and B, um, do a more thorough safety inspection, check the brakes, does the bike actually ride, are there any issues you wouldn't see with a visual inspection. Um, always happy to talk more if people have questions about these audits. Um, these are the results. There's a graph on the right, the yellow line shows, um, or I'm sorry, the orange line shows um, the total number of percent of incorrectly parked bikes. The blue line shows uh, the percent that are obstruction hazards. They both um, start out uh, in Q1, grow in Q2, shrink in Q3, shrink in Q4. Um, so we did see improvement throughout the year. That Q2 was where we filmed the video and released it with Anna. Um, and we hope that that led to part of the drop. Also wanna recognize that those Q2 randomly selected audits the majority of them fell in areas that don't have great bike parking. Um, and so lo and behold, if there's not a big wide paved, wide paved furniture zone and we hadn't installed a corral there yet, uh, people were more likely to block sidewalks um, in those areas. So this shows we improved throughout the year, but very, very clear, we did not meet our goals and we need to see more improvement in this next year. And that's where I'm gonna talk the rest of this time about. Um, so education, that's one of the pillars that we look at. Um, previous, uh, last year, we kind of left it to the vendors. We set some guidelines, hey, you need to educate them. You have to tell them how to park. We want to see some in instructions on the bike. We want to see some instructions in the app. And then um, we also uh, partnered with Rooted and Rights on the video. Um, it wasn't enough. We didn't see the parking improve enough that we wanted to. And we're t making some changes. Um, I also do want to call out that these changes um, were made in a lot of consultations and a lot of meetings with Anna and Rooted in Rights and um, Disability Rights Washington. We had a lot of great conversations with the Seattle chapter for the National Federation for the Blind um, and uh, the, the Commission for People with Disabilities in, in Seattle. Um, we had those conversations previously. And I think for the planners in the audience, this is a 101 mistake that I'll go ahead and say I made. We had conversations, we didn't touch back. We didn't revisit, hey, how are these changes working for you? Really big miss. Um, but this year we had more ongoing conversations. We really took to heart the things we were, we were um, hearing and were committed to having those conversations to see how these changes uh, affect um, behavior. But the key changes are, we're going to require users to take a digital parking quiz within their first few rides. And um, every few months after that, um, it's not a big barrier, um, but it's going to add some friction to the rental process. And vendors were reluctant to do it without a mandate. Um, with a mandate, uh, they've gotten on board and we hope to roll that out in the next couple months. Um, it should be fast. It should be something that just has a couple photos. Is this bike parked correctly? Yes, no and then a pop-up of why that bike was or was not parked um, correctly. Um, we also want to have users take a photo of the parked bike at the end of the trip. A lot of cities have done this with scooters, have seen some success. We really like that, hey, it's gonna get um, people just thinking again when they finish that trip. If I have to take a photo, maybe I'm gonna think about it a little bit more. Is this bike gonna block someone's way? And then education, that's really, really important. Um, would love to, if we launch scooters this year, have another conversation with Anna about a, a larger video that includes scooters in it. Um, I think 
cities can leave some of this to uh, the companies, but they also need to um, do, do a lot of the education themselves and really invest in it and make sure that when users are using this tool, uh, they know how to park and ride correctly. Um, finally, we are investing in a public reporting tool that rule, uh, rolled out last month. Um, essentially, it's a city's version of an app-based 311 that also has a call-in number and a, a web reporting tool. So someone can report a misparked bike to the city, let us know what company it is, and then we'll immediately forward that um, report to the vendor, and then they need to move that bike within a few hours. And then the other end of that enforcement, I um, want to show on this one really how that shifted throughout the, the from the pilot to last year to this year. Um, in the pilot, we find vendors if they weren't compliant. Um, we did collect some money, uh, a good chunk of money actually, and we didn't see behavior improve. Um, the vendors in 2017, 2018 were really well funded. It was really competitive. Um, there was a lot of venture capital and free floating bike share kind of ancient history it feels like now. Um, and so finding a company didn't necessarily change behavior. And we also saw that, hey, if there's a future where there's smaller vendors, which we've now seen, um, would we just uh, then punish the smaller vendors and the well-funded vendors could continue to pay their way through misbehavior? So last year, 2018, 2019, we said, okay, let's shift that and let's go to fleet reductions. This is a hyper-competitive market. These companies are competing for market share. If we reduce the fleet of the vendor that's not doing a good job um, getting their users to park correctly, they will have reduced market share. The vendor that is doing a good job will have a greater market share and greater success. That's how it's gonna work. Well, in that same time, scooters came on board, took a lot of the venture capital, took a lot of the attention, and um, we saw that last year fleet reductions didn't work. We did uh, several rounds of fleet reductions to both vendors. And um, again, saw improvement uh, for sure. Want to recognize that. Want to recognize the good work that Lime and Jump did to improve throughout the year, but we didn't see quite enough. And so we're seeing this year, hey, the city needs to have all the tools. Um, we need to have those fleet reductions. We need to have vendor fines. And, and then a key, and this is something that um, we really talked a lot about with um, the disability advocacy groups I mentioned before, but user-based fines. Um, Portland's tried that and seen a lot of success in their scooter program, but essentially um, if a user mits parks a bike, our audit finds that, um, then the, um, we essentially issue a fine to the vendor, the vendor collects that fine from the user. It's only $20, um, more really of a reminder, we hope. Uh, we also um, want to make sure that the vendors are, um, giving users sufficient warnings, um, and then also using that trip and photo that I talked about previously to protect users that did park correctly. Say you parked the bike, someone else kicked it over, you're issued a fine, um, the vendor says, the vendor can even before it issues you a fine, look at that trip and photograph and say, hey, I thought this wasn't the person, we're not gonna issue them a fine, and that's just fine. And finally, um, do you wanna touch base on COVID, um, our partner right now, Jump, is disinfecting every touch point every time they touch a bike. Um, that's every time they service, every time they rebalance, every time they battery swap. Um, obviously not every time a bike is ridden, and so we are um, trying to communicate that to the public through social media and other means. Hey, if you need to travel and you need to use bike share, um, it's there for you, but please, um, wash your hands before or after, wipe down the bike if you can, don't touch your face, kind of all the, those key messaging things. Um, another thing is Jump's essential worker program. Jump has um, offered free service to all essential workers now through June 30th in the city. We've seen that grow and expand. Um, we wanna see it grow and expand more, but um, we're seeing people using bike share and people um, using it uh, for free to get to their essential work hopefully making things a little easier for them, especially if we've, we've seen these transit cuts. And that's the last point. Um, as this recovery happens, when it happens, um, we can't stress enough the importance of non-car options um, as, as things open back up. And uh, keeping micro-mobility in mind and, and promoting it, I think will be an important tool um, 
in the future. So thank you very much. And with that, I will pass this back along. Thank you very much, all. Um, this was excellent. And it was not really nice to go deeper into your reports and policies and learn where the city is. And we have um, a few questions for you that I'm going to dive in. And again, thanks much um, to all our panelists. So I'm excited to move to our next stage. We have around 15 minutes or so for the questions. And I would like to start with a question from one of our attendees, um, which is very relevant to something that you have mentioned, Joel. Um, you indicated that 25% of Seattle residents used bike share uh, in 2019, which is great. And the question is, What's the future of bike sharing after the pandemic? And I would like to extend this a little bit more uh, to perhaps to other micro mobilities and ask you all um, the question of, yes, we have seen micro mobilities serve critical trips during this pandemic. Um, how do you envision micro mobility playing a role in reopening our cities? Go yeah, on. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's something that uh, cities are struggling with as we speak. Um, you know, we, we still in Seattle have seen um, a really great success story over the past um, five years with our mass transit system, with our buses, with our light rail. And um, we don't want to see that go away. Um, and it, it's taken a big hit. Bus usage is down 73%, I think it is, um, over the course of the pandemic. Bike share usage is down similarly, but a little less in the kind of the 60 to 65% range. Um, and so, while well, recognizing that we should continue to invest in transit and transit really does need to main, remain the backbone, um, people might be slower to get back on transit as things open up. And if there's other options, if there's bike share, if there's scooters, if there's things that they can use to safely get around or maybe to get to transit as um, there's a reduction in service, things like that. Um, it's important that they have those tools. If they don't have those tools, there's a couple outcomes. One is people that can will get in a car um, and that'll just lead to the same climate path we were on, um, the negative, um, the, the, the air pollution that just exacerbates the whole um, COVID um, um, recovery and um, and or the people that don't have a car are just going to be stranded and we're going to um, really see a more inequitable transit system as it comes out of it. So we think um, bike share, scooter share, not the answer, but it's a part of the answer and it should be something that the cities lean on. Great, thank you. Uh, Ron, Anna, do you want to tune in? Yeah, sure. I, I, I think Joel is right. Um, you know, we're, we're actually seeing um, reduced ridership across the board, right? I think that's not a, not a surprise. Travel is just down, generally speaking. Um, in some of our markets, it appears, although we don't have, we don't have great data on this, it appears that um, cycling is probably uh, occupying a higher mode share right now. <laughs> Even, you know, the denominator is lower, or whatever, but you know, but it's it seems to be a higher percentage of all trips, um, even though all trips are down. So, I guess the question is, you know, how do we continue to really support over time transit as the backbone? I think Joel's right; it has to be the backbone. Um, make sure it continues to thrive while also locking in um, some improvements uh, for micro mobility to to really shift mode to, to, to create mode shift away from single occupancy cars. Um, and obviously, when it comes to micro mobility, you know, we, we think there is potential for, for gains kind of post COVID, but we also recognize that um, if we do continue to grow micro mobility, it has to be done so safely. Um, in particular, you know, we have to build the infrastructure to support it, as I touched on earlier, have the right policies, we have to have the right kind of parking so that we're not creating hazards um, like Anna was addressing, you know, so eloquently. So, um, you know, there's a lot we have to do, but I think there's also a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is Anna, and I, I mean, I think what's really striking to me in, in all this conversation is, yes, you know, transit is down in, in Seattle 70, 73 percent, but there's still that, you know, quarter of the regular ridership that's still riding transit, um, and I think it's really important to, to have a conversation around 
and, and base any sort of rebuilding of our transit system around the folks who don't have other options, who are truly transit dependent. Um, and I think the same is true for all of our other public spaces that we currently use for transportation, our sidewalks and our roads, you know, who, who is, who does need to be using these spaces? Um, and, you know, for whom are these the only options? I think, you know, it's sort of so shocking. It was shocking for me to come back to a city like Seattle um, that has a reputation of being very liberal and very environmentally friendly and see what a horrible state of repair the sidewalk and pedestrian infrastructure is and that, you know, every light is prioritized for moving cars as quickly as possible. Um, for many, you know, many traffic signals there, you have to, there's no pedestrian recall, you know, you have to push the button um, to get seen. There's, um, you know, there's automatic traffic signals too in the city that, you know, when they were first installed had no way of detecting pedestrians being present in the area. And so I just like a real, I think we really need to, to shift how we think about transportation and whose mobility matters. Um, and, and larger picture, you know, for environmental and public health reasons, really think about what travel um, we want to prioritize and facilitate and how we can design our communities so that uh, the things we need are closer and are in walkable and rollable distances and are accessible by public transit. Um, you know, perhaps you don't have to, you know, get in a car to go to Costco to get food, that there are, or, you know, go to the nearest hospital, which, you know, I live in, in a part of this town where there, there are no hospitals, right? Because it's a, it's traditionally the lower income uh, part of town where folks of color live. And so how can we build um, the, the services into the, the, density of our communities and build enough affordable housing in these communities so that we have access to what we need um, in a more sustainable and more equitable and more accessible way. Yeah, that, was, that, is, that, that is wonderful, really. And um, I don't want to wait, there are some questions. And uh, Ron and Joel, I have uh, two questions a bit out of safety, but it will be great if you can maybe quickly respond to those. And I will start with Ron. Um, you mentioned the data privacy report. So the question is, what was that privacy report that you mentioned, the data <clears throat> privacy report? Yeah, I'm honestly still getting the details myself. My understanding is that the ACLU, um, released a report today, or maybe it was a letter. <laughs> I'm still getting the details on this, but um, that outlines some concerns that they have uh, around data privacy uh, when it comes to some of the data kind of sharing platforms that are being used in the micromobility space and in particular MDS. I honestly don't have much more um, details than that right now. Okay. But you certainly, I'll, I'll share it with you. We can share it out to the group. Yep. Okay, that sounds I'll perfect. I'll run it down. Yep. Thank you very much. That sounds perfect. And Joel, two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, if you have looked into the VMT impact of redistribution of these bikes, given the Seattle's large geographic area, and if so, what kinds of mileage are you seeing? Um, that's a, a great question, and no, we have not yet. Um, that is written into the new permit, uh, permit 3.0, that vendors need to send us um, um, kind of a life cycle analysis of the bikes themselves and then uh, track their VMT usage for rebalancing battery swaps and all that through the year and report that to us at the end so that next year um, we can have a, a much more educated um, look at, at those figures and what the overall climate impacts of bike share might be. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another question for you. So how do you ensure the vendor passes the $20 user fine onto the user and does not just pay it for them? Yeah, uh, that's a great question and something that we're still struggling with. You know, there's, there's always going to be the next thing and, and we're not doing everything perfectly yet. Our current plan is to just do some secret shopping. Um, we don't know whether that'll be other city employees, whether we get uh, friends, whether we try and reach out to communities. Um, really just kind of at the conversation level, but that's really how you have to check a lot of this stuff is get on the ground. And that's what we're doing with our audits. Um, you can't just look at the data. You need to go look at what's out there and you need to look at how vendors are actually responding. And that's looking at, Hey, are they moving the bike when they say they did? And that sucks. It's you have to report a bike and then go back and look at it in a couple hours. And that takes a lot of work. Um, and the same thing for this, are they passing on the fines? We'll need to do some secret shopping and, and check on that. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, and one final question. Um, so I very much like this from Jeff Wood. Um, he acknowledged the information about the how corner bike share stations can protect pedestrians and slow speeds. And he was wondering if you are looking at ways to document close calls uh, that are not necessarily get reported, but we all know really it's happening, but often unreported. Um. Our Vision Zero team has done some of that analysis, and I know our um, one of our suburbs over in Bellevue did a look at that as well a few years back. Um, I don't know um, where kind of in the cycle of um, those analyses and a, a new look at that um, we are, um, but I think that's something that we're really interested in. And um, I think the city as a whole does look at, but um, we haven't kind of redone the study since we've added all these bike corrals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have a personal um, a question from, from me coming. Um, so the, the, it, what types of infrastructure work best for promoting safe micromobility use? And I'm also referring when I am asking this question, uh, the idea of slow lane or light individual transport lane that I have recently read that are dedicated to micromobility devices. So do you think that that would improve safety for users and pedestrians for individuals uh, with disabilities? I think this question goes to you all really. Um, Anna, do you want to take the first crack? Sure, yes, yeah. so this is Anna. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, building more of these, these uh, you know, what could be considered previously, like, you know, protected bike lanes um, for, for scooters, for, for lighter kinds of mobility, I think is great. I think they also, you know, for wheelchair users, when our sidewalks are often in really terrible condition and there aren't curb ramps and they're the, you know, responsibility of individual property owners to maintain and to clear for snow, um, bike lanes actually offer a, a, a chance for additional mobility, especially if the city is responsible for maintaining them. And they do, you know, at the same level they're maintaining the streets for cars. I think it, it offers a really a uh, possible, you know, future. Um, you know, I think one thing that you hear a lot from the disability community, and I, and, and from um, folks who are opposed to scooters and, and bikes, is you know, not wanting to share space as pedestrians. And, um, you know, I think that is something that we have to have real conversations about. I get frustrated, you know, especially at these conversations around close calls and people, you know, talk about all the times that they almost got hit by a scooter or a bike on the sidewalk. Um, we don't have that same level of scrutiny with cars. And, and frankly, you're much more likely to be killed by a multi-ton vehicle than by a scooter. Um, but we've become numb to, you know, sharing space with cars and are therefore so much more comfortable with that. And so I think that's just a, a place where I, I find it frustrating um, around the safety conversation. You know, I have a good example of that. It's, I won't name the city, but um, uh, they were going to find scooters that were parked in the sidewalk $100 and find cars parked in the sidewalk, blocking the sidewalk $25. Um, so, you know, there's something a little out of whack here, but and that's not uncommon. But I do think to your question, um, you know, protected bike lanes and creating kind of low stress, you know, uh, bike and scootering facilities in the street. It's just one of the best things the cities can do. And the research really backs that up. Obviously, it's a, it's a great way to kind of get keep people off the sidewalk. We can also create in street scooter and bike parking to make make sure the sidewalk is really dedicated to the people who who are walking and, and you know, pedestrians, right? And so, and a good, I have an anecdote to back that up. So we've been offering free um, memberships, bike share and scooter share memberships to healthcare workers around the country in the markets where we operate. And a friend of mine who's a doctor said, you know, I would love to take advantage of this, but I'm just so afraid to ride a bike uh, in the street. And I know I shouldn't be doing it on the sidewalk because that's dangerous too. So I'm just not going to do it, you know? And so there's room for improvement, uh, I think on both fronts. Mm -hmm. Ron, what is your response to this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, you know, the, the problem goes, you know, to all levels, to like our infrastructure, what we've built, but also goes to code and the laws out there. Like Seattle's just, the cities can't and the states can't kind of adjust their code as quickly as these things are, are changing. Um, uh, the example from Seattle is right now, Bikes are allowed on sidewalks, um, obviously bike lanes in the street. Scooters aren't allowed on sidewalks, aren't allowed in bike lanes, 
And so to legally ride a scooter, you have to be in a street. So if there's a bike lane or a street with four lanes and, and 40 mile an hour traffic, you know, where the law says you have to be is on the street. Um, uh, an electronic skateboard, those can go 30 miles an hour. Those can't be on the street or in a bike lane. They have to be on the sidewalk. Um, so the, there, there's just a lot of work to do at kind of all levels. Um, and we need to start getting after it. And, and our um, scooter share program is proposed and it, it isn't approved yet. But um, it's proposed that, hey, we should make sure that scooters are allowed in bike lanes. I think that's a, a easy win and an easy conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I got um, two, two more questions and I'm going to read all together. So the first one is um, the pandemic measures are struggling to change the minds of those who would rather prioritize economy over public health. I think we see both sides really. And um, our attendee was um, um, acknowledging that it reminds um, him or her the gap between micro mobility advocacy and those who feel more entitled to the road. So how will you use or we use this moment to strengthen our message to counter or persuade in these kinds? Are we prepared for counter narratives that would uphold business as usual road use? Um, I'll, I'll speak from the city perspective and I think those thoughts are, are really important. I think it's also really important that that um, kind of reallocation of space comes from the community. Um, I think we need to listen to the communities that have been marginalized the most in the past and, and see what changes to the infrastructure need to happen um, to make uh, those transportation inequities um, lessen, right? Um, you know, we've seen that um, COVID is disproportionate, disproportionately killing um, people of color and people of lower incomes. And so we need to listen to those communities and say, hey, um, when we reopen, what changes need to be made to the transportation infrastructure and how we allocate that space that meet your needs and that meet kind of our climate justice um, mm -hmm. goals. And I think that's kind of an important first starting point. Uh, Ron, what do you think? It will be nice to get your insight. Yeah, I mean, I think, A, I'll just flag that the Shared Use Mobility Center put out a nice report on this uh, not long ago. So plug for them. Um, more or less on this topic, kind of the post-COVID world and, and resilient cities and so forth. But I think ultimately my hope is that city leaders um, and state and federal leaders for that matter as well, really see this an as an opportunity to come out the other side of this crisis in a way that lessens the necessity for people to have to own cars in this country, which can be a substantial financial burden. Um, and of course contributes to a variety of public health and environmental problems. So, um, you know, the goal should not be to get back to usual where you pretty much have to own a car in most of America to get around, um, but to really break that, um, break through that barrier and to, to emerge out of this crisis with a very different um, uh, distribution of transportation modes across, you know, <laughs> So higher mode, higher modes for uh, mode share, I should say, for biking and walking and transit and carpooling and, and what have you. You know, we have this is a really unique moment in time. Uh, in some ways, um, we have an opportunity to change the transportation landscape in, in, in a way we haven't had in the past. So I'm hoping we'll take advantage, recognizing that we have financial uh, challenges at the city level. Uh, and I'm sure Joel is more aware of that than any of us. <laughs> but there's also a real opportunity here. Yeah, I, I very much agree. I, I hope we can take advantage of what we are going through. These are very hard times, but we should find a way um, to reach to the better. And Anna, I, I wanted to ask you if you have anything to add. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think we absolutely have to have a conversation around the public health and environmental health impacts of uh, car-centered uh, communities. Um, mm -hmm. I think now is the time to have that conversation as we're seeing, you know, what it means for folks to have um, poor health because of air quality, because of lack of access to active uh, active transportation. Um, and so I, I really want to have that conversation. Um, and I want to have a conversation around, you know, talking about the folks who, the you know, quarter to more than a quarter of our population that doesn't have access to cars. I think so much of the sort of coming out of quarantine, at least here in Washington state, it's been framed entirely of like, that you're just going to use your personal quarantine vehicle um, to get around and do things. You know, you can do drive through this, you can do drive through that. Um, and for a lot of us, that's not going to work. 
um, individually and for our communities, that's not going to work. And so I really, you know, I, I, I'm scared that we're going to come out of this um, with people feeling most secure in their cars. And that's, that's the universe. Um, and at the same time, you know, public transit's going to be gutted. Um, ride hailing uh, for all its problems um, does serve, it, serve a, a lot of us who can't drive. And I think that's going to transform dramatically and be less affordable and accessible. And so, yeah, I, I am worried <laughs> that we're not going to come out of this in a better place. I think we all share your worries, really. And by the way, I got permission to extend a couple of more minutes. Uh, we have a 4.30 reception for everyone who wants to join, but we will go a few more minutes. And we have a question for Ron, and this is kind of also something I had mind. There are similarities or differences in scooter and bike share, whether it is related to the policies or it is related to the usage. Uh, so one of our attendees mentioned that on a bike, he or she can still give hand signals, but on a scooter, um, mm -hmm. there's a need for two hands on handlebars and there are no blinkers. Uh, so the question is, is the next lift version of e-scooter going to have turn signals or blinkers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I've heard that one before and because it, it's such a great question, right? Um, right. You know, we don't have that on our scooter right now. I'm, I'm not maybe I'm not aware of any of the do, but maybe they're out there. Um, it's definitely something that's you know, on our radar. And I think, you know, as Joel pointed out, um, it, it seems like more than two years ago that scooters really kind of hit the streets, or maybe you know. But it's it's only been a couple of years really that scooters have scooter share, I should say, has emerged um, uh, with with uh, in, in earnest, and the products are continuing to evolve. So I, I think you're going to see a continued continued evolution of um, the product design to address these kind of issues, to be safer inherently, um, and different types of products out there. You know, um, so long story short, we don't have that right now. It's definitely something that's that's on our radar. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I have another question. So perhaps um, we can start with Anna. What type of training do you find work best for the use of, for new users of micromobility options? Maybe we can specifically refer to e-scooter or bike share, whichever you think might be more important to talk. And um, I don't want, I want to raise this question, not only from the perspective of residents of a city, but also visitors, because the rules or regulations might be different for safety and people might not be aware of what to do exactly. So what types of training would be most beneficial for our new users? I really like the idea of having the, the training required in the apps, um, what Joel was talking about earlier. Uh, I think that's a great idea. And um, yeah, I, I think it, it should be, while it might be a point of friction, I think it, it's a necessary point of friction. Um, but I also think, you know, the larger picture is that we need the infrastructure to support the, the mode share that we want to see and the behavior that we want to see. Uh, and, you know, you don't have dedicated parking for micro mobility anywhere um, aside for the sidewalk. Of course, that's where things are going to get parked. And that's, that's not an acceptable solution for those of us who need sidewalks to get around. Right. And Joel, Ron, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think it's important that... Um everyone recognizes that, um, especially a couple of years ago, most people hadn't ridden a scooter and everyone was a beginner. And um, if and when we launch scooters in Seattle, a lot of folks are gonna be beginners, especially those people that can't or don't travel to other cities. Um, and I think having a really robust education program, um, the opportunity for people to try these um, are all ideas we had and um, we're trying to rethink now. Um, if, if there aren't public gatherings, how do you do hands-on safety? Um, one thing we are looking at rolling out um, in a future scooter program is um, first ride cats. It's something that a couple of vendors offer as an option. We're looking at making it mandatory. And again, for it's gonna add friction. Um, it's gonna be silly for people that don't need it and are confident they're going to be like oh you know I tried Lyft scooter and it was super slow but I tried Lime in that other city and it was fast and so you know there, there's going to be some complaints for sure but we think hey those first couple rides um, let's keep it slower than that 15 mile an hour cap that we have for, for scooters and bikes um, let's bring it down and we don't know if it'll be eight or ten or what that'll be but something that says hey 
until you're, you're more experienced, let's keep you a little bit slower just for one or two rides. Um, so that's one idea that we have as well. Mm -hmm. um, Ron, anything you want to add? And I am going to conclude with one final question that we just Yeah, had. yeah, I'll, do, I'll just mention that to, to Joel's point. I mean, what we're seeing in cities that have had scooters for a year or two is that it's not just riders who are moving up the learning curve, but it's kind of the cities as a whole. Um, as, and I mentioned this during my presentation, you know, people who are driving cars and the city officials who, you know, clean the streets and on and on. There's just, there's kind of, everyone's becoming more and more accustomed to this. And, and we think that ultimately that kind of acclimation is going to help with safety. In addition to the product improvements that we talked about earlier, there's a, I, I won't go into all the details now, but there's dozens of ways that our scooters have become safer. We don't have turn signals yet. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of features that have been added um, and a lot of in-app education happening. So similar to what Joel's talking about, I think we're getting better across the board. Um, the companies that, that, that run the uh, scooters, the cities that we partner with to, to manage this, this environment. And uh, I'm optimistic that we'll continue to see improvement. Thank you very much. It's great. And my final question, if uh, are if anyone is aware of any moves anywhere to in integrate transit and micromobility training into getting driver's licenses. Hmm. That's not a conversation that we've had yet. And that's um, okay. interesting and, and something that, that should be thought about. Okay. Okay. I think this is, this is all really, I uh, we are, we are 15 minutes, 13 minutes <laughs> over our conversation, but this was great. I would like to thank you all for joining our session. This was really a rich conversation. I very much enjoyed and learned a lot and we are perhaps leaving with many questions to think, which is great. I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you all next time and discussing more. Um, and I wish you all a great rest of the day and enjoy the summit. Thank you very much.